Many of them were abducted and enslaved. And recently, we, in most recent research, has found out that this was government policy, not just simple initiative by a Turkish neighbor who would be interested in the Armenian girl next door. No, but the government actually organized the, um, the um, absorption of this population in the Turkish community. Now, I want to say two things about this process. This is very important. First of all, um, you might argue, well, this means the Turkish government did not kill or did not target for killing all Armenians. If they leave women and children alive, then it cannot really be a genocide. I think arguments like this, they miss the point. They miss the point that, as we know, in Turkish culture and in Middle Eastern culture in general, is a patriarchal culture, which means men are superior to women. And women in traditional Middle Eastern cultures don't have a political identity. So they can be changed. They can marry into another family and be absorbed and forget about their past. The second important point here to make is, of course, there was an existing culture of of kidnapping of brides, of achik pachtsnel. Kidnapping was entirely normal before the genocide in many parts of the empire. Now, in the genocide, wh why did this happen? This is also important. Why is there such a process as achik pachtsnel? Why? Because, um, obviously, for a family of the man to pay the dowry for the girl, if it was too expensive, the man would go out with a gun he would take the girl and kidnap her and run to the mountains. The family would then accept it. They would come back, no dowry to pay. It's a cheap way to marry, right? Now, this changes in the genocide. In the genocide, the government tells all these young men who want to get married, who want to marry and want to have women, they tell them, you know what? You can do whatever you want. Nobody will say a single thing to you if you organize this. So without state involvement, this could not have happened on such a mass scale. It's important, state involvement. The state involvement is best documented in the state orphanages. The government set up orphanages because, of course, the war is going on. So many children are becoming uh, orphaned because their fathers are out on the front. Uh, there is um, hunger in the country. There's diseases. But these orphanages were slightly different for Armenian children. For Armenian children, they uh, received Turkish names. They had to convert to Islam, and they were made into Turks. This reminds us a bit, a bit of the Native American boarding schools. In Canada, you also had these residential schools, I think. This is a, f a form of assaulting the identity uh, of the victim without necessarily uh, uh, killing them physically. So the argument here is you don't necessarily need to kill every single uh, the victim physically or eliminate them physically for it to be uh, a genocide. And then this brings me to the seventh important um, vector, aspect of the genocide, this famine crime. Now, we tend to think that famines happen in East Africa, in Somalia, and Ethiopia because the governments are corrupt or the, um, the crops are wasted because of a terrible drought. It's natural reasons. And if it, human beings have anything to do with it, it's because the governments are uh, incapable. But there are two, two exceptions to this uh, rule in the 20th century. The first one is the Ukrainian famine of 1933-32, when Stalin closed off the country and refused any bread to enter, as a result of which three up to three million Ukrainians died, at least. The second example is the Armenian genocide, because the young Turk regime, the government, constructed an artificial zone in which a famine was meant to occur. In other words, upon arrival in the Syrian desert, in Derzor, there was no shelter provided, so this is a crime of omission, but also there's a crime of commission, the Turkish government took active measures against the deported Armenians there, against, so to make sure that they don't buy any bread from any bakeries, they don't smuggle any food anywhere, um, and to reinforce this famine, existing famine. 
So the government created an ethnic hierarchy of food. Turks all the way at the top, they always had to get food. Then under it, other Muslims, like Arabs, Kurds, Albanians, or Caucasians. And all the way at the bottom, we see the Armenians. So this is a political, this is a political famine, and it's not a natural famine. It's important to point that out. Against denial arguments, thinking we couldn't help it. There was a famine, people were dying. We want to help, but it didn't work. The evidence suggests that this is not the case. That when the famine did happen, the measures the government took only made it worse. Even after they were told from Derzor that the measures were exacerbating the suffering. And uh, we're still not there. This is the last aspect of the genocide, the destruction of architecture and of material culture. I, by material culture, I mean anything you can hold on to, anything you can grab, like buildings, churches, architecture, uh, monasteries, as a result of which many churches were ruined. Some of them were also deliberately destroyed. And here too, you might argue, well, look, the Armenians were gone, uh, so of course the churches were not looked after, so they, they crumbled. They became dilapidated. That's not what the evidence suggests. The evidence suggests that there's widespread evidence of intentional destruction, as a result of which thousands of churches and, and monasteries and other buildings were ruined. So not just a crime of omission, again, this is a crime of commission. Now, what I would like to argue here is that all of these cases that you've seen, these different forms of the genocide, they might be different uh, in their shape, famine, deportation, decapitation, um, um, cultural genocide, but the ultimate outcome was the same, the categorical destruction of the Ottoman Armenian population. And if you would ask me, could you please say in two or three sentences, what makes it genocidal? I would say two things. First of all, all of these measures, they targeted the category of group identity. Of group identity. All Armenians, loyal or disloyal, apostolic or Catholic or Protestant, uh, men or women, left-wing or right-wing, religious or secular, all Armenians were targeted uh, for destruction. So the victims, in a way, they cannot do anything about it. Anymore. It's not their behavior that causes uh, the violence, it's their existence. The second thing I want to say about this is that we see a general expansion of the genocide in terms of categories. They begin with these uh, elite men, such as Krikor Zohrab, such as the bishop that, you, that you've seen on 24 April. Then they expanded to all Armenian men. Then they expanded to all Armenian men and women. Then they expanded to all Armenian men and women and children. Then they expanded it in 1917 to Armenian Protestants and Catholics. In Ankara, for example, there's an Armenian Catholic community. Um, and beyond that, last minute, they even expanded the genocide to Armenians who had converted to Islam. Not just during the genocide, but also before. And after that, they even expanded it one more further to include non-Armenian Christians. So Assyrians, I want to emphasize here, ladies and gentlemen, are also victims of the Armenian genocide. Uh, the Assyrian community, the Chaldean community, the Jacobite community, in Diyarbakir, Mardin, the Nestorians in Hakkari, all of these were also comprehensively attacked and assaulted and destroyed. There are some differences. And I'm willing to talk about that in due time. So a gradual expansion. Now this was the first part of my talk. In the second part, I'd like to talk about how the uh, Turkish government dealt with this legacy of genocide. After every genocide, what we see is that the perpetrator group tries to silence, downplay the violence. It's embarrassing. Um, they will be confronted with reparations in front of the world audience. This doesn't look good. So they like to suppress. This counts for almost every genocide. The victim community, of course, wants to speak up, is traumatized, 
um, physically and uh, psychologically, and would like open discussion about this, or recognition. And this is what we've been waiting for for 100 years. Now, let me start first with the, the, the Turkish government. And there are two aspects to how the government has dealt with it. One is the destruction of memory, and the second aspect of the construction of memory. Because when I, was start, when I was doing my PhD research, I examined the genocide and how it works, how it functions in a region, in the Arbakar region. And then I, I asked myself the question, you know, what, ha what happened to these, to these people? What happened to the government and the Turkish society after the genocide in the 1920s, in the 1930s and 40s? And what I'm uh, presenting to you now is based on that uh, research. Now, we can say that after 1923, the Kemalist government, so based on Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, perpetuated and continued the policy of suppressing all information on the genocide. It was prohibited to talk about it. You could not write about it in the newspaper. You could not publish books about it. If you wrote books about it, they were prohibited, confiscated, and destroyed. And the destruction of books is the point I want to make here is unparalleled. I saw very thick dossiers and files in the Turkish archives in which the government orders books to be collected, confiscated, and burnt, destroyed. I'll give you only two examples. Now, the book on the left is a classic um, a book by Avshak al Boyajian, of course, the uh, historian of Kesaria, Kayseri. This is a two volume book uh, in which Al Boyajian is a very good historian. He takes it from the antiquity to the Middle Ages through the modern times. Now, I saw a very interesting document in which somebody from Aleppo, from Alep, was sending this book from Alep to Istanbul to one of his friends. And the Turkish police, they opened the letter and they found out this book. They called the intelligence, and intelligence said this book is prohibited and cannot enter this country it must be destroyed. So the book was sealed, sent to intelligence, and intelligence then had the book uh, destroyed. Because on 5, 10, 15 pages, al Boyajian talks also about the genocide, of course. The second example is the famous Franz Werfel, uh, The 40 Days of Musadar. And the Turkish government prohibited officially this book uh, in January 1935, one year after the Nazis. Uh, prohibited the book. Now, these are some famous examples. What is important here is that the then Turkish government, they didn't care that Armenians were publishing books in Cairo or Beirut or Halep. They didn't care about that. You can do that, but keep it outside of the country, because otherwise the population will read about it and learn about it, and then you have a mutiny on your hand. This is an important point. In addition to that, we see the destruction of forensic evidence. Um, forensic evidence is the, um, the notion that every genocide, of course, leaves corpses. And it leaves physical evidence. Now, in 2006, in a village in southeastern Turkey, in Mardin, I showed where this is, local villagers, they were herding their sheep. They have their nakhr and all this, you know sheep and they're, um, because they're interested in, in husbandry. They found out that there was a cave and with a couple of rocks in front of the cage. So they open the, in front of the cave. They open the cave and they find uh, the, the view that looks um, like the pictures on the left. So this panorama of a mass grave with many uh, bones. Of course, they call the police. The police comes in and they seal the area. Um, and the word leaks out through these villagers that this is an Armenian mass grave. Of course, as soon as that came into the media, the Turkish Gendarmerie sent uh, a delegation of uh, a Turkish, uh, I would call them archaeologists, or quasi-archaeologists, and they argued that, yes, we did some research on this, and we even brought a Swedish researcher. This is the man on the left holding the, with the glasses holding the, the flashlight. 
And we came to the conclusion that these are uh, remnants from the Roman Empire. And of course, people wanted evidence. So what they did is they took from some of the museums of Turkey some old pots and vases, and they placed it in the mass grave to pretend as if this was a, a mass grave from the Roman Empire. Of course, every single historian of the Roman Empire was laughing because there was no such uh, evidence to be found. Most importantly, the local villagers, they themselves gave, inter gave interviews to the media, to the newspapers, arguing these are not Roman graves, these are Armenians uh, who were killed in July, 1990, uh, July 1915. And we know this because our own grandparents told us that they killed them. So what better evidence would you want from this village when there's a collective confession? So the destruction of forensic evidence is an important case. And there are many other cases of that as well. Um, I spoke to a Kurdish man. He was from Mush. And uh, he grew up in the city. Uh, but before that, he was in the village. He was in Varto. I'm sure you've heard of Varto. It's a, famous, it's a really beautiful town. And he was playing there. He was a small boy playing in the village. And there was an earthquake. And I looked up when this earthquake was. And it was uh, 1966. And an earthquake, um, there was a landslide, a mudslide, and part of this hill, of this mountain, then slid down into the valley. And it bared this mass grave of hundreds, possibly thousands of bones. Of course, the village elder, the Mukhtar, calls the police. The police comes in. Same thing. They call the gendarmerie. Gendarmerie comes in. They seal the, they seal the place. They uh, evacuate all of the bones, and it disappeared, never to be seen again. Now, what's interesting, of course, the villagers at that moment, they were, they were told to uh, shut up about this, to not talk about any Armenian issue related to this grave. Otherwise, there would be trouble. And of course, the villagers, they knew really well whose bones this, uh, this mass grave belonged to. Now, this is the destruction of memory. The books were destroyed, they were burnt, so Turks couldn't learn about it. The forensic evidence, the mass graves were destroyed, so you have no, um, you have no physical evidence. And in addition to this, official histories were constructed. Um, the Turkish state, like all nation states, they needed national histories, national myths. And an interesting exemplary is I studied some of these history books from the 1920s and 30s. So if you were a Turkish boy or girl in the 1920s and 30s and you went to school, what did they teach you about the history? And here's a good quote, and I'll read it to you, from that history book. The Turkish nation, which was living the world's most civilized life even in prehistory, fled westwards nine to 10,000 years ago due to natural and inescapable reasons and undoubtedly also passed through Mesopotamia and Anatolia. The nation to first have eked out a civilized existence in Anatolia is the Turkish nation. Anatolia has never lost its Turkishness, its national existence, and has always remained Turkish. In the Great War, the First World War, this region was saved from Russian invasions and Armenian massacres and arson. So there are two points here. First of all, on the one hand, they say the Turks have always been there. But on the other hand, they say the Turks came in later and civilized it. So which one is it? They're contradicting themselves. The second point is that we see a blatant denial of uh, the narrative of the genocide, even in the 20s and 30s. So you're a little boy. You're eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. You go to school, this is what they teach you. And if you have an exam, and the question is, what happened in the Great War? What would you write? You would have to write that and believe in that. And in entire generations were um, uh, educated, in quotation marks, uh, with this version of history and consumed this body of knowledge. Uh, these books were widely distributed and this still con constitutes the canon, so the, 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 the cornerstone of Turkish history. And how different is this from 
let's say, Germany after the Second World War. When Germany was occupied, the first thing American, British, French, and Canadian liberators did was they went into the Ministry of Education uh, and they took out all the Nazi propaganda and they destroyed the propaganda, much of it racist, much of it silenced the violence the Nazis committed themselves. And they started building um, a, a realistic version, a realistic history of German history. 